every time I see myself on screen, I say, I will lose weight. Stop looking at me that way. <laughs> וענת, המיקרופון פועל אם את רוצה על
condition entitled America by numbers, quantification, democracy, and the birth of national statistics, uh, bore on the relationship between the invention of random sampling in the US and state intervention, interventionist and state planning during the New Deal. Um, his second book is Benchmarking, which we didn't talk at, at all uh, during our uh, conversation, is a concept, is a, a, a important concept in uh, Diaz's work. And then uh, the third book is Stat Activism, which is also um, uh, an important uh, theme uh, in his work. And now he's, uh, uh, he edited already uh, the last book of uh, the late Alain de Rosier entitled Proof and Govern a Political Analysis of Public Statistics. And Alain de Rosier passed away uh, a few years ago before he had a chance to publish it. Uh, recently, he has been working on a project on big data in the domain of health and especially in genomics. So uh, again, Manuel, thank you uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, uh, and the floor is yours. We are very happy to have you here. Thanks a lot for that. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks a lot for watching. And thanks a lot for those who are patient enough to come to second. <laughs> That's very kind of you. I didn't say initially, maybe I think it's the moment to say that so that you remember the name of my center is Salt Wes and Wax. Wes and Wax was the was a sociologist who was the heir of Emil Durkheim, the founder, one of the founders of sociology, and he was Jew and he was killed during World War II. He died in Auschwitz actually. So we named the, the department according to him for part of this reason. And he was also actually uh, lots of uh, writings have been done about it. He was also a sociologist of quantification. So this is why I feel at home in this, in this, uh, part, in this center. <coughs> so we had lots of conversation uh, for some of the of you listed, but we, uh, we just come out another conversation and we didn't talk about something which uh, is also very important to me, is that different numbers give different style of government. And this is what I want to, to, to present to you today. It is taken out of my, my the book, which is called America by the Numbers. And it's an argument so which is in the book. And I want uh, <clears throat> to show you uh, several things about this. So again, I want to say and to prove to you that statistics are not only a descriptive tool, but they are also, and at the same time, a political and transformative tool. This is very important. Uh, not, this is not the only thing, but the, the government, the other point that I want to make is that government statistics embody the conception, several conceptions of the nation as a well. whole. When, you, when the government produces statistics, the government has to, in a sense, represent society within the statistics. And it's not the results that are interesting, it's not the numbers. It's not to say that there are 58% of men in 2045, uh, and, uh, 58, so it means 42% uh, of women, etc., etc. The problem is the way the data is produced is in itself mirror of how the state conceive society. And I want to show you, this is not a trivial element, but I want to show it to you. The point is that when quantitative method used by the government change, the politics that the government is going to use changes too. This is another point. So when you have, a, and you can see, especially in times of crisis, when there is a big crisis, it means that before you had a certain conception of the society, of society, and society is changing towards a new sort of society. And in this case, this is the, the switch from one to the other is at the same time produced and has effects on the reflexive tool that you have uh, to capture this when you're the government. Finally, the story that I'm going to tell you is the story of random sampling surveys. I don't know if it talks to you, but for all the statisticians and all the sociologists, you know what random sampling is. I don't know if I need to, to explain it. Random sampling is a way to produce surveys. So it's sort of polls. The polls produce with a random sampling of the sample. So you, you choose it according to a uh, rule of random 
Form is symmetric. So my outline is very simple. I will contrast for you two kind, two methods of the statistics so that you understand how those two methods are at the same time very different in themselves, but also how they prove that the, co the government con conceptualized society very differently before and after, after the depression, and how they, the government conceptualized its own intervention within society very differently before and after the, the, the depression. Okay, so it's a two, it's a two, two parts uh, structure of, of my talk, and it's very simple. The first one is the first part. And the second part <laughs> is the second. So, <laughs> so uh, first of all, I want to describe to you statistics that are now fairly forgotten, but are in fact very important in the conception of how statistical surveys function. The very first statistics were invented in the US. So it's not exactly this. this is the very first partial statistics, that, not the census, the census is older, but the partial statistics were invented in the 50s, 1850s in the US for the following reasons. When you are a farmer, oh, sorry. So when you are a farmer uh, working on your, on, your, on your farm, you spend your time on your farm, okay? So it's very difficult to have a very good, uh, a very good panorama, a very good uh, understanding of how agricultural works in your day. When you are a buyer of agricultural goods, then you go from at that time you are going from farm food to farms to pick up the the, the, the farms the farm products. Okay, and this simple thing of going from farm to farm give you a very good sight on how the market works, whether it was overproduction, underproduction, et cetera, et cetera. And so since the beginning of agriculture, there was an asymmetry of information okay, between the farmer, the producers, who didn't know well about the production, and the buyers who could have a much better picture of the, of the whole market, okay? And so they had, they had a problem. And a, a journalist, initially it was a journalist, his name was Orange, actually, yeah. Absolutely, completely forgotten in the old history books now. Orange, he was uh, the editor of this American agriculturist, and he said, You know what, you, my readers, if you just send me information about how much and how well you produced agricultural goods, and I will aggregate it and publish it in my, in my journal so that you will have all together a sight of how the market is. And so you will have, info, you will have argument for the marketing moment when you have to sell your produce, you see? You will have an idea. And so that's exactly what uh, 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 happened. Uh, it, it was totally grassroots statistics. They came out of the, of the, the farm of themselves sending information to the journals, okay? In 1952, it's the date when the agricultural department is uh, created in the US. And immediately, they created a service of these statistics. They took it for themselves, saying that the government has to participate in purifying the markets, in a sense, okay? Because asymmetry of information makes markets unpure, okay? And so you have, the government's task was to purify the market, and they did it immediately. And they used the list of correspondents established initially by this journal. Okay, and so they had farmers sending directly information to the government, so that the government could uh, 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 gather all this information and publish it and purify the market. I hope I am clear. Uh, <clears throat> so what I want to do now is to follow the, the fate of a questionnaire to prove to show you how the very the different little steps that uh, explain how uh, a data and number is produced and all the very little tiny decisions that are, are taken uh, that prove how the society is concept, it's conceived at every little uh, step, okay? So you see here, for example, in filling out the question there, uh, one of the th very funny things is that the, the, the Ag Department, Agricultural Department, produced lots of pictures to help the farmers fill out the questionnaires. And they were distributing those pictures very easily so that people know how, knew how to, to do the things. And then here you can see that people don't see it, but it's very interesting to notice that the guy has glasses, okay? And he works on a very clean table, 
Okay, so doing statistics is first of all, first of all, you clean up with the mess. You see what I mean? <laughs> and you put your glass up and you, <clears throat> you fill out the questionnaire with numbers. And it means that those persons who were able to answer the questionnaires had at the same time cognitive and moral abilities. Why am I saying this? Because they were able to estimate numerically the results of their own farm. And at the same time, they, had, they were public spirited. If they were doing this, it was for, not only for themselves, but all for their neighborhood, for everybody around them, so that everybody could benefit from this information. Okay? So it was very precious for the government because it was a direct link towards the farmers. And the government had a way to, 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 to be linked to the farmers. Okay? And to create this bond, the government created a, a newspaper co called Crops and Markets, and they sent the paper to the farmers so that they had the information in advance, in a sense. Okay, and so <clears throat> they created this fidelity bond between farmers and the government. This is very important because most, if you go back to the 90s, if you know a little bit the history of the US, the federal, this is a federal government, I, I should have mentioned, this is a federal government endeavor. And so at that time, when the federal government was talking directly to the farm, many farmers thought it was suspicious. <laughs> okay, they were resisting to the, to the central power. Okay, so this constructing of the, of the bond was very important. I want to show you the questionnaires and you will understand afterwards why it's important, but you see the questionnaire had very specific size. It was long yeah. like that. And the numbers were put here in, the, in, the, in these little boxes at the bottom of the questionnaires. Okay. And here you have the explanation of how to, to fill out the questionnaires. And the second part, so it's, uh, it explains that you have to be precise, to be precise, uh, to stop, etc. It's all this explanation. And so another point which is very important is that it was not uh, anonymous at all. On the contrary, they wanted people to keep their name and to, to create this bond. You see, it's, it was not anonymous at all. Then in the 20s, a very big <coughs> uh, scandal appeared because, so I, mean, I, I want to be very fast, but uh, after World War I, there was an agricultural crisis in the US. Why? Because during World War I, uh, Europe stopped producing uh, agricultural products because we were uh, fighting actually doing war. And so the US had a new market and they could send lots of produce in Europe and, and, uh, and send lots of uh, agricultural products. And then at the end of the war, then this market vanished, disappeared. And so there was a sort of, sort of overproduction of agricultural products. And so the government said, it was at already at the time, the government tried uh, uh, advertisement campaign in, in a sense saying producers produce less and you will see this is real but you will earn more because the quantity will be less so the price will go up and so you will earn more more, more produce okay so the government did this policy the point is that statistically they could see that the production went, well, was indeed going down but after one year they discovered that the price did not go down so it was a, a, a failure, the whole failure of the policy. Why and how to explain this? The, their explanation was the following. The guy that we are asking the information are public spirited. So their idea is, okay, let's follow the government. Since they say it, we have a public, we have a public spirit. We will uh, raise down, we will go, uh, we will have our production go down, okay? But all their neighbors, they didn't care. They thought, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's not produce less. We will earn more in any case if, if we continue to produce as much, okay? And so the statistics were down because the statistic survey per person declared less, but their neighbors were not doing the same, you see? And so they decided that there was a lack of objectivity. This was the, the time, uh, the, the term appears exactly at that moment, objectivity, the place of this moment. And they tried to produce more objectivity. And so they created this crop method so they hired a statistician, one per state, and the guy would drive his car along the fields. And when he was uh, driving along a cornfield, he would push this button, the cornfield, and then he would switch to a wheat field, then he would push the button wheat, etc. And so that he could measure exactly <coughs> the size of the fields of the, of the, the production. Okay? So in a, in a sense, it was replacing subjective answers by Object, more objective information. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Okay, but something very interesting appeared, appeared is that the head of the Department of the Statistics, William Carrington in CDI, so again, it's someone who nobody knows who is except me and you, uh, he completely disappeared. But the point is that he said something very important. He said, yes, but we will not replace all our farmers by only machines. Why? Because in this case, we will lose our users. You understand? All this bond that we have created between the state and the farmers would disappear if they don't give the information themselves. So we need to articulate the data together, but not sacrifice the farmers to the machines. Otherwise, we will lose a lot. Okay, you see, we absolutely need the farmers to participate to the whole endeavor. Otherwise, we will lose our uh, interest for everyone. Okay. Uh, so this is something I like. You see, this is the, the way the reason why the questionnaire was so weird. In fact, they invented spectrum because one of the problems at that time <coughs> was how to add up different questionnaires. Imagine that you have 200 questionnaires on your desk and you want to add some some figures on only one category in the questionnaire. It's super complicated actually. Figure out it's okay. And so the idea was to use this spectrum. So it's a it's sort of a metallic uh, element that uh, goes like that. I don't know how to put it. And you put all the questionnaires one under the other put an empty one at the end, and you could add all the questionnaires without copying them. And it raises down on all the elements of, of mistakes, you see. So it's very interesting to see that <clears throat> to produce, uh, 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 to, to, to produce a neighborhood, to produce a geographical unit, then first of all, you have to produce the unit of the questionnaire themselves. You have to physically articulate them together so that uh, it creates this uh, unit. Then, being something very interesting, you had to send the information to, to Washington DC where they were to publish the whole final result, okay? <clears throat> so the guy who was in this car, in this car, I described to you, he had this the job to send the information to Washington DC for his state. But when you have the information for a state, it is already valuable information. You knew that you could, with one state, you could begin to uh, uh, speculate at the uh, speculate, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the word is the, I can use the word of the, that works for the, 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 the stock market. Yes, you can, uh, once you have the information of the production, you can speculate at the stock market. Okay, so you don't want to uh, to have this information with you. So they had to they had to uh, use a code, a secret code, and you see. So in fact, the information they were sending or sort of a very weird poem. So Wisconsin Barley, and then I can't read, but it's, it's word that they, they had invented a secret code for every number from zero to 120. And so they were writing the numbers in, instead. And so uh, the point was to send all the information without writing any numbers so that nobody could learn about those numbers, okay? Except your, your, uh, your colleagues in, in Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., what happened? At the beginning of the 1900s, there had been a very big scandal because one guy, a statistician at the agricultural department, he understood that his information was very valuable. So he had a friend in the building in front of, of the Department of Agriculture, and he sent him the information about the production so that his friend could, uh, could go and quickly speculate before they published the information. So, you see? so it was insider information. So the idea that is that statistician are like everyone very interested by money. And so they were able to, to also speculate uh, with the information they were themselves producing. You understand that it's a very big problem because if the government does that, then the numbers are going to be again completely useless. Okay. So they invented something called the Board of Crop Estimates, which gathered every Thursday, every Thursday. It was a part of the Department of Agriculture. All the clo the door were closed, completely closed. As you see here, they were cut, they were uh, cutting all the telephone lines. Okay, they were shutting down all 
the curtains so that nobody could see through the, 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 the window. And all the information sent by the local statisticians were sent to this specific address, which was a mailbox, a safe, it was a safe, a safe mailbox, you see. And only the, 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 the Secretary of Agriculture, only the Secretary of Agriculture had the key to the safe. Okay. So every Thursday, he came, opened the safe, and then could the board begin to work and producing the central number for the, 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 the country as a whole. Okay. So this is how it is described. <clears throat> the world, so the board, how did it work? So this is very interesting because it's a work of experts. And as I told you, the informations are of different nature. So you have to put, for example, information produced by the, the, the informers themselves. Okay, So this is sort of a subjective data. And then you have to uh, articulate it with objective counts of the machine, of the, of the car, you remember? And many other types of data. This is not possible to calculate this. You cannot calculate the mean between subjective data and, and uh, objective data, okay? So the experts, they had to sit around the table, like you see them here, and they were together commenting on the data. And then they had to individually, each for themselves, estimate the real right estimate that they felt was the best, okay? There was no calculations, only people that knew very well how agriculture would work, and they were simply doing this, okay? And then, so everyone, you see, so here, you have the board, the, the, the sheet of paper for one individual in the board. And then they copied the results which are here in this columns for every single person of the board. So you see, these are the names of these guys. So this was the, the sheet for one person. The results were copied here, copied by uh, tiny little hands that you don't see on my picture because they are vanished and they were obviously you know, arranged like this later. And then again, they were comparing their results as a board to establish the final figure, which was an estimate of the different estimates of the different guys. So usually they fell very close to one another, but sometimes they were very different. And so if they were different, one solution was to take the mean, the median actually, it's, <coughs> it's called the median. Medium is the number, you know what's the difference between the median and, and the mean? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <coughs> so they, they took the median, but sometimes it was difficult to choose a median. So in this case, they simply discussed the best result. And the number was the best estimate according to this conversation. But I, I think it's very interesting because it looks so old fashioned. But indeed, it's exactly what happens nowadays. When you have numbers that are not comparable and you want to find a final number out of those numbers, there is no other way to them to rely on to rely on experts. Okay. Once the medians, the numbers, the final re results. For, oh, so <clears throat> so I, I I will just quickly. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I have to explain. So this is for wheat. This is the, the sheet for wheat, and the the problem was to estimate the estimates for re big regions of the U.S. and then for all the states of the U.S. Okay, and so this had to be done. Uh, and the, the different columns are the different type of information that they had, okay? And so the point of the, of the board was to establish all the final results for each of the various states so that they can add up finally and say what was the production of the US as a whole, okay? And actually, it is very interesting to know that the expression the US as a whole appear, appeared exactly in this situation. The, as a whole, this is a weird way to speak about it. It, it appeared exactly with statisticians. Uh, so they find the median, and then <clears throat> very important, they show the results to the Secretary of Agriculture, and the Secretary signs the results. So the, the expert work is, in a sense, confirmed by the political authority. You have to put together political authority and expert work. Okay, and then <clears throat> they were uh, writing down the crop report, which was the final uh, result of all this work. It was done by, as I said. A bunch of uh, clerks who were doing it, and they were uh, publishing this war and this crop report. This crop report. And what happened to the crop report? It's very interesting. At exactly 3 p.m. Uh, on every Thursday, the head of the board, you can see this guy here, had the door open by the board, so the guy could come out of the board. 
I want to insist that I, when I was when, while I was doing my PhD, I was at Harvard and then I went to, to Washington DC, I actually uh, experienced it. So it still continues. So you can so I said I want to see how the board works, and they said, yes, sure you can come, but beware if you enter the board, then you will not be able to get out before 3 p.m. So take the sandwich. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, and indeed that's what happened to me. I entered the board, I, I see, I saw them work, etc. etc. Uh, and the, the, the door was completely locked, and it was impossible to get out. Okay, and then what happens? It's so, in which year are you talking about? Sorry. In which year did this happen when you got into the board? Because it's not so obvious. <laughs> this is what I tell you. I was there in the, at the end of the nineties. Wow. It was exactly the same. No, but the form is. Only, it's interesting that you raise the question because the form of insider information is always the same. Inside, they are, they are here solving the problem of insider information. And there is no other way to solve the problem of insider information. You have to lock people into a room, otherwise people can send the information somewhere else. So, so it looks old fashioned and my pictures are black and white, but the story is really still very, uh, very uh, contemporary, okay? Maybe there are all other questions, I don't know. And, but, and now comes, I think, the failure the failure, failure part. So you see, the, the head of the board, he would go, come out with the crop report, and there would be tables like that with telephone. Mm -hmm. He would put the, the crop reports on every te telephone, and in the middle of the room, you have people here, they are journalists actually, and they happen to remain behind the straight line that you see here. You see that? <laughs> and at 3 p.m. exactly, he would shut, no, he didn't shut, he said, go, and they would run to the telephone. <laughs> And send the information to the journal. <laughs> and it's very interesting because the picture has been taken several times. This is from the 1910s. This is from the, the 20s or 30s, I think. Exactly the same. You, that, that you see that rush into the telephone booth. And even in the 50s, they're, conti they're continuing the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> and the point is always to have no insider information. You see, it's, it's really exactly the same point. <laughs> and so, well, well, I think it's funny because on this picture you can see that they, they are a bit more ashamed than they were before. <laughs> okay, and so the information, you see the information from very many different sources and get to the proper part of the and then thanks to those journalists, the information could spread all over the US and uh, finally act and stabilize the markets exactly like that. Okay, so you understand? <coughs> You see, I have an example here for you. Uh, uh, they published lots of papers explaining how it works. And you see, here you find my picture, the picture that I used. And here they explain exactly the story that I told you about. So this is the 1930s, but I mean, it's exactly the same. And today, today, uh, well, today it's not true, but in 2006, I was doing some field work in Iowa City. And in Iowa, when you drive your car and you get bored, you put the radio on and you say, and you hear the radio telling you numbers that it's produced like that. Okay, so it's really it's, it's still uh, actual. Okay, but it's a very specific kind of network of data. Okay, the the point is that <coughs> the government <coughs> is a clearing house between supply and demand. Okay, uh, so <coughs> the, the different uh, conclusion that I want to, to, to that I want to to, to uh, take, take out of this is several things. First of all, as you see, the government play a very important role in a liberal world. In this case, it's, it's market form, okay? So it's what we call liberal world, okay? Usually, you think that the government doesn't exist in the liberal world. It's only a problem of market, they say. But the problem is that to have purified markets, then you need a government to purify those markets. Do you see, do you see my point? Oh, yes. I don't know how, how it's clear to you, but in France, my students usually, when you say it's a liberal role, they say the government is somewhere else, not there, okay? In this case, I want to prove that, as you saw, the government have, plays a very important role, okay? A crucial role, actually. Second, there is a method, a very specific method, which is a method of reporter. And as you see, it's an information that comes from, from the grassroots world, and it's very important that the users of the data are those who produce the data themselves, okay? The market is, so the guy who send the government, the information to the, to the government is the one who is going to use it for his own marketing purpose, okay? 
you see? So it's very interesting. It's, it's a very uh, important point. And it relies a lot on neighborhoods. I, I switched this a lot, but in fact, it relies a lot on neighborhoods because the farmers had not only to uh, give information on their own farm, but on all what had happened in their neighborhood. Okay, so the concept of neighborhood was absolutely crucial. So, so this is the end of the, my first part. I, I don't want to, to go too much deep, long, for too much time with this story, but <clears throat> the, the, the point is that, you see, the point that I want to make now is you've, we've seen a, a specific method of sampling people. Huh? You understand why it's sampling people. Choose a certain uh, amount of informers, and the way it is done is that those, those persons are self uh, chosen, they say that they want to participate, they send the, the information to the government, and the information of the, and the government plays an important role in purifying the market. Okay? So this is a very important point. Then in the 1930s, what happened? The Great Depression. I don't know how long I have to tell the story about the Great Depression, but in 1933, 99 to begin with, the, the stock market in the US went deeply down. All the, all the economy got completely uh, destroyed, if, if I may say so. And very quickly on, the, the, the farmers were really in a very bad position. You probably have read, read uh, Grapes of Wrath. This is a super book or a super movie. And you can see how poor the farmer was, wears, etc., etc. And so, concretely, for the government, it meant that this way of acting, of purifying the market, didn't work. It was a proof in a sense, proof of concept, a very, a very expensive proof of concept, that this way to, to, to fight against, uh, against poverty didn't work at all, okay? And the idea of Roosevelt and his team, that was that they were slowly uh, trying to conceive, is that they needed to intervene directly in the, in, in the government and to create uh, projects that would hire people, okay? So that people would get a salary and not fall into Personal depression, in a sense. Okay, uh, I want to say I want to say that at the beginning of the uh, of the thirties, the idea was not Keynesian at all. For those who are into economics, the, the, you know the, the Keynes has the, the idea that if you if people are too poor, then you give them money. The government give them money so they can consume, and consuming uh, gives money to the company, so the company invests. And investing means buying other things, and so the the economical circle goes on and on again. At that point, the, this, this idea was not absolutely not stuck forward in, in the US. This came out afterwards, but the idea was different. The idea was if you let people too long on unemployed, then they simply lose their skill. And then the economy is very bad because everybody is simply this uh, demoralized and nobody knows to work, uh, knows how to work anymore. So you have to put people to the job. This was mainly the, the point. So the, the idea was how to put people to the job. To do that, you need certain information, which is, for example, where is certain, uh, uh, where are certain uh, labor skills located in the in the in the country? How to produce produ produce projects that locally would be useful for this and that workforce? How to you see? So you need a new description of the economy. So that the government could cleverly, if I may say so, create the new project, the new in, uh, in, uh, intervening new project. Okay. So the problem was not anymore the equal sharing of information, but precise information for the government. The problem was to be precise for the government. Okay. And it happened that in the st statistical department in the US, this is a slight, slightly different story, so I won't go into it. But random sampling was beginning to be to be worked, okay. But it was really the very beginning. It was not at all something established at that point. At that point. And then <laughs> there was a mix of civil servants working in agricultural department and of, of statisticians in universities. They met and they thought that maybe they could de develop this kind of new techniques of sampling, okay. And so what I am going to tell you now is to show you the new technique that they were they were using, and you will see that it's a completely different conception of how society is, is, is constructed and a new conception of how the government is a, should act upon the economy. 
So when you want to make a random sample, why do you need a random sample? It's because when you make a selection of a sample in a universe, to speak like the, like the, like the statisticians, you always make a mistake. I mean, when you select a certain amount of information in the universe, the mean that you calculate is always different of the mean that you have that, that you would have had if you could have the information on the whole population. Okay, I, I hope I'm clear. What the statistician has had invented is that it's possible to measure the size of the error that you are going to do. Okay, it's called error interval, interval error interval. Okay, it was possible to calculate this, and they said, yes, let's do that. This is going to be super. We will have information, and we will know how precise is this information. This is the point that we need. But to do that, you need to be able to randomly select a, a sample, okay? And to randomly select a sample, you have to have every individual represented in an urn and never without any repetition, okay? Uh, I hope I'm clear. You have to put every single individual into your urn so that he has a probability to be, to be involved, but nobody should be uh, uh, repeat, repeated, otherwise, the, the it's not a fair distribution of, uh, of uh, probability. You just heard, I said it, fair. No fair, we are in between the question of fair, of politically fair and statistically fair. So <clears throat> I'm going to go very quickly, but the idea that they have is that it's not possible to, to, in the US to select individuals because you, at that time in the US, you had no list, you had no uh, uh, list of how individuals uh, you have no list of the individuals, but very quickly. The idea that they had was to select portions of the territory, okay? So they tried to gather county maps, as, much, as many county maps as they could, and their idea was that they could draw little, little squares like that, and then if this square would be selected, then they would send a surveyor in only this square and ask questions to the people living there. And so if you have a, 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 a very, minute representation of a certain amount of area uh, of zones, then you would have a perfect representativity of the US, you see? So this is what they do. But the problem is that in the US, the US is, is very large, as many of you know, and even in the 1930s, many zones of the US were, had never been cartographed, cartographed, okay? There was no maps uh, of several uh, zones of the US. Uh, especially, for example, the Bayous, the, the, the Southwest, the, the Louisiana part, all the mountains were not mapped, etc. All the, the zones that apparently are not that important, but if you want to do a complete sense sample of the US, you need a general map, okay? Which year? Which year you refer to now? This is, this is the 30s, 1930s. 1930s. Yes, 1930s. Yes. So the statisticians, they are not shy. They simply hired airplanes with picture with uh, photographs on the airplanes and they send and they send on the location where they had no maps they send those aerial uh, photograph to bring photography of all the zones that they had mapped and their idea was that you see you can see it here they can draw they can draw on the on the photography to establish new zones that they could eventually maybe sample then <clears throat> it was a very large work they had to <clears throat> Again, I don't want to go too deep into it. You can go back and you can question, question me on this, but uh, they had to establish very long lists of all these little squares that they have drawn on all the maps uh, so that they could randomly select them. So they had to write down, at that time it was manual, but even today it could be manual because even with the computer, you need, you need someone to, 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 to do it. So <clears throat> there was it done. And it's very interesting because for, to do it, they hired lots of, at that time it was the, the Great Depression, so you had lots of unemployed people. And so they hired lots of people to do this. And it, it, it turns out that those people were young women, very often wasp people, because, <clears throat> and in Europe, from the Midwest. And their idea was that, <clears throat> this is interesting, I think for the, the gender, uh, gender students uh, in which you are, the idea is that, that it's typically feminine uh, pro, uh, uh, skill to be, to be precise and patient. You see, and counting little squares is specifically something that a young woman can do. 
Okay. And so this is where you can see they go, they hire lots and lots of, of this work. For cities, it was slightly different. For cities, they, all, they, they had already lists which are more easy to use. So, for example, gas list, election name, names of streets, etc. So, so they, they used <coughs> uh, uh, lists instead of maps. And so, thanks to these elements, they were able to draw randomly a certain kind of sample so that they could have information about many other things. What I want to show you now is that it changes this the, the, the way statistics are produced changes lots of things. First of all, the statistician have a completely new role. Remember, initially the statisticians were guys who were either on uh, their, their car and driving in the, in the countryside and trying to discuss uh, the information with the, with the farmers. Okay? Now, statisticians are within an office and they simply look at maps. And they point to maps. This is very important for the Victorians in the US. Pointing to maps is super important. So we <laughs> point, point to maps. And so and you can see this is important. This is Mahana Nobis. This is an Indian uh, uh, statistician uh, who was invited uh, at that time to work with everybody. Uh, you see that so they were sitting in their office. So, in a sense, what I want to say is that uh, statisticians at that time began to be uh, much more office people as they were before. They were much more mathematicians than they were before. <coughs> See, for example, this is now they have to calculate the, risk, the error. And to calculate the error I was talking about, you have to be good in probabilities. Probabilities is not, is not completely straightforward. So you have to come out of classes of uh, uh, statistics, etc. The former statisticians, they were absolutely all unable to do this. Okay? So this is a page of a, a paper, uh, <coughs> a paper published about precisely the method I'm uh, describing to you uh, to, to, to show you that they have different skills. The surveyors themselves have different information kind of uh, uh, skills. For example, they had to first of all discuss with the farmer what not only what was his production, but mainly what was uh, his uh, his uh, the border of his uh, farm. And second point, this is very different. Now the new thing is that the, the statistician has to convince the farmer to accept to give the answers. You see, before it was a given. Since it was the way people were selected, okay. Now they have to convince them to do that, and it's very interesting because at that time it was during the Great Depression. Statistical surveys and statistical projects were used a lot to hire those people who were unemployed because of the, of the depression. So there is something very interesting in the fact that uh, so the depression produced unemployment. The government wanted to create information about economy so that it could fight against unemployment. But to do this, it already hired unemployed people on relief uh, funds to produce this information, you see? So the, in a sense, the, the unemployed people were themselves fighting against the situation that they were uh, suffering from. So <clears throat> it's a very complete new kind of uh, uh, ways to produce statistics to conceive society and to use it by the government. First of all, the participationism <laughs> so initially is replaced by state interventionism. Okay, the government wants to act, and it's not the farmers themselves that will use the data. It's the government that will do that. Welfare state was developed exactly this way. Thanks to the surveys, it's much easier to produce data on new objects. This is very important. For example, unemployment and farm abandonment. It is possible to ask questions about this question, about these problems <coughs> on new survey, on new questionnaires. It was not possible on the former questionnaires because <clears throat> the farmers would not be able to, under, to answer the questions about, uh, about unemployment, for example. You see, they were not, they, to have information about unemployment, you have to really have uh, surveyors that ask you questions. Okay? It's a new geography uh, of, uh, info, of, of statistical information because thanks to those maps, you can cut. The US in several uh, sub zones very easily. Okay, and so you can have uh, new information. It's a new temporality because thanks to surveys, you can produce a survey on a completely new topic in, let's say, three months. Okay, this was absolutely not possible before. Uh, it's super, it was super heavy, and they actually did not do that to change the questionnaire 
for the for the first method, it was not possible because the farmers would not know how to, to fill it out intelligently. Uh, okay. Now they could switch the subject very quickly, and so the information was more uh, adapted to the rhythm of a depression. This is very important. The transformation of the depression can be followed by the data. I hope I'm clear on this point. Uh, so it helps the work, the government uh, uh, enlightened, it enlightened the, 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 the work of planning of the government. <clears throat> so I will uh, jump immediately to the conclusion. <clears throat> again, now again, we see that the government is still acting upon society. The society is conceived completely differently. Now, you don't have a participation of the farmers uh, to produce a solution of the uh, economical solution, but you have the government planning state interventions and who ask information to the farmers so that he has information to intervene. You see, it's very different. The conception of the society is completely different. And the conception of the action of the government is also completely different. So now I, am, I have reached my final conclusion. I hope uh, the PowerPoint was pretty clear. So you see, I wanted for you to contrast two different statistical methods. The first one could be called the liberal statistics, and the second one could be called what it is called nowadays, the random sampling element. Okay? Those methods, well, the methods in themselves were fairly different. But it's not only the methods that they were different. They were also compatible, let's, let's, let's say, say so, I use in my book the word, uh, <clears throat> they take consistency with different kind of societies. In the first case, it was a society, a completely liberal society, and afterwards it's a different society, sort of, very soon they would call it the big society. And then it is also a completely different way to intervene for the state within the economy. In the first state, in the first case, it was purifying the markets, and in the second case, it was planism and intervention within projects in the economy. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a two different point I wanted to make. And so, in a sense, statisticians have always to solve this equation, very hard equation together. So they have the conception of, of society, they have a political repertoire, and they have to find the technical and the, and the statistical solution, which is a method that joins the two, the conception of society and the conception of government intervention. So I am done. I hope I have been clear. And I hope you are, you are next week. Well, if you ask questions in the, in the Okay, I do. Please don't ask too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you, Manuel. Um, those who work on statistics know how fun it is. Uh, it is. Um, the method of uh, taking the snapshot with the airplane was uh, done. Well, for the degrees, we were uh, oh, wow. objecting. Yeah. Okay. No questions. Yes. I feel you all. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So basically, um, the American data industry has a secondary uh, industry in which, um, let's put it this way, the, the, the data that is accumulated owned by the American public. And this is why it makes more sense in the United States to take this data and um, amalgamate it differently and resell it based to a new state. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the data that is um, accumulated with this, the, the agricultural one, is basically used by other companies for other and other industries. This is true. This, this is true. This is a question. This is a question. No, no I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out if this is like the first time it happened or no, no, no. Like the point initiation, is the, because there's a huge industry of data in the United States and it's owned by the government. And then you have then Bread Street and all the other companies that are using mm -hmm. and they're really manipulating the data again. 
Exactly. Yes, it's exactly the, the point. The, the point is that this is the beginning of it, and since the beginning, the data, government data, is not is ne has never been only for the for, for the people. So it's, it's always for the for the for capitalism, for the companies. Okay. And so, one of the questions that I didn't raise here, but which is super interesting, is to understand how public data is articulated to the private sector. Okay. So, and this is a long story. It begins there because you see farmers are private companies. It's are small, but they, they, it's private companies. And so you can follow this data, this history also since a very long time. One of the very inter interesting points is that nowadays, I think it is fairly undescribed how the connection between those big companies you're mentioning, I think you're thinking of uh, Clafas and others, the Google, Apple, uh, Facebook, and, uh, Amazon, and, uh, and Microsoft, thank you for coming, uh, are using the public, public information. And I think there is, as we, we just discussed it, there is lots of work on uh, open access data, but there is very little description of how open access is useful for big companies, big tech companies. And this should really raise lots of questions, lots of sociologists and anthropologists should, should work on this. Actually, I have a student who works on this question, and I can tell you it's super hard to do it. The guy, he went to, to California, he tried to enter, it was Facebook, and after two months of very hard uh, fight, he finally got invited within Facebook, but he had no right to even take notes, paper notes. He had no, no right to do nothing. So he could discuss with the guys, and but his hand in the back, he <laughs> to put it there. without taking obviously no pictures, no notes, no recording anything. And so he had, he told me, he, it's funny, he had to, to fake a really big necessity to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> and after 10, 10 minutes of every conversation, he was rushing to the bathroom, <laughs> taking no down his notes and then going back to the interviews. So, but I think this is a very important to topic that should be that should be digged into. Yes. Is there any standardization? Um, do you think there's going to be any standardization um, in Europe about um, data, about big data and collection, especially the collection uh, of data? Because um, once you have the data and the statistics, it's very hard to refute it. Um, so is there going to be any standardization in the business community? Well, standardization happens when actors who produce the data need it. So it is, it is happening right now. And well, what, well, you know, in Europe, one of the things, it's not exactly a standardization, but it's a regulation of data happening with uh, what we call RG, RGPD. Have you heard of it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so this is a way to use the data that is uh, actually really changing the game. Uh, so, so standardization, for example, standardization is happening in, within medical medical data because you need it because the doctors want to have it standardized. But if actors don't want to be standardized, it won't be standardized. This is quite, quite important. Is it working? Yeah. 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 Collection of big data by governments and by um, different arms companies and private industries. Basically, um, you can't tell much about the quality of the data that's being collected. So, um, and it's very difficult to refute. Because once you have big results and it's being, um, people put all kinds of uh, uh, statistics and, uh, and present it, it's very difficult to refute it. Um, yes, but in a sense, what, what happens? Yeah, sorry. The quality, of the, uh, the quality of what's being collected is very difficult to verify. Yes, but in a sense, you won't care because the precise point is that they won't share the data, data so they are, they are the only one who uses it. So, what, what they do with it, if it's bad data, I mean, uh, what they say, shit out, shit in. 
she can cheat out, you would see what I mean? If they have bad, bad data, the bad data would not get bad conclusions and then the company will go down. So, So the, the, it's a very good question the, the, because the problem is that what what is under your question, what is hidden in your question, is how to recognize the data, which is super complicated. And in fact, during the depression, uh, those the, the first the first kind of data, uh, more and more, initially they were initially statistics were was really in the in the twenties. Let's let's be in the twenties. Statistics was mainly an agricultural. Uh, discipline. It was worked in an agricultural department, so it was really intimately connected to, to, to statistics. And then the depression comes, and then they try to enhance the quality of this the, the quality of this data about the market, and they see that the the results are not better. And what happens initially is that bureaucratically the group the, the, the unit who was doing this, this board of corporate students, etc. Initially, they had very nice offices, lots of uh, hiring, etc. And the more the crisis, crisis goes on, and they notice that they have less uh, means to hire people. Uh, they are moved to another uh, uh, branch, which is less uh, prestigious, etc., etc. And so they are really thinking about how to. What's happening to us? We are going. We are getting. We are, we are becoming less. Uh, Let's um, recognize. And then <clears throat> there is something super important is that uh, the very first Agricultural Adjustment Act, uh, maybe, so I have to go deep into, into the details. In the very first Agricultural Adjustment Act, the idea of Roosevelt and of Wallace, Henry Wallace, who was the Agricultural uh, Secretary at the time, was to have the government sign. A contract with every single farmer who was willing to do it for a reduction of their of their of their uh, production. Okay, so they, and then they hired the statisticians of my group, the one I work, to verify that the declarations of the farmers about their uh, uh, reduction of their production was true or not. So that all of a sudden, those guys. <coughs> Became not helpers to fight against the, the, the fighter, but they were help, they were judges that put them at risk to earn less money. You see what I mean? And so, what happened is that all of a sudden, all the farmers said, "We won't give you any information at all because now you're betraying us." Okay? And so they were really looking for all other ways to 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 to, to be useful. And at that moment, at the precise moment, and this is really a connection in a sense. Some guys coming from Europe actually were developing this random sampling story that I told you, uh, but in, in, in the Department of Statistics. And so in the Department of Statistics, they thought, ah, maybe this is a good idea. Maybe we could change it, like, uh, the way we can be useful. And, but not being clear on the real uses that, uh, that could be made with this new kind of, of data. Okay? And so they seem to develop this new kind of statistic initially really like in a play of uh, trial and errors, you see. And then uh, the people in the government discovered that they could use it for specific programs. And so initially it was one or two uses, and then it spread, 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 spread. And this is how it, 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 it changed. And did farmers feel as though they were being written out of the story? So, uh, so, so they, they, were, were there farmers who objected to no longer being the, the people that produced the data that they ended up using? Or good question. Uh, it's more general. In fact, what happened is that there was there was this that you know right, it's a larger well, well, uh, answer is on a larger uh, uh, side. It's for, for example, C right meals. You know, the sociologist sure. he had a very big argument about the fact that this kind of method were massifying the the, 
the farmers, transforming the, the, the farmers into a mass and not into public, a, a real public that could really act about it. So it's a general argument. I, I never thought, and I, I have to say, I never thought about the relief of letters or something like that, like individual things. But, uh, but uh, uh, the argument of massification was very strong. I have another answer is that, uh, so I have a colleague, her name is Sarah Igo, sure. and you know her, and she works on, on the Gallup polls, and what she found is lots of letters saying, but I don't understand the results, you didn't uh, ask me. <laughs> I don't understand how it could be true since you didn't ask me. <laughs> so in a sense, it's a, it's a nice information. Yeah, and she, and she showed how, um, how uh, the narrative of the uh, one unit, the, yeah, the the, one unit of the, yeah. of the you know, population mm -hmm. through these uh, uh, opinion polls and uh, yeah, none. I have a, thank you very much. It was very interesting. I have a question regarding the liberal phase of the story. The liberal conception of the market relies on an image of the market as consisting of isolated individuals, buyers and sellers. Now, if sellers have, if there is an, indeed a, a, an asymmetry of information, if seller, sellers have more information, if buyers have more information, it clearly threatens this notion of a free market. But the point is that to fix it with giving, uh, uh, with collecting information from buyers and spreading information from buyers, allegedly fixes the, this problem, but fixes it with another, with a further divergence from the concept of the market. Now every buyer, uh, every seller can uh, uh, act according to something, you know, collective information. So is it really, uh, uh, a liberal, is it really uh, uh, a, a, the, the liberal conception of the market that is produced by, by this uh, statistical means or is it some kind of a simulation of a, a liberal market? So uh, maybe the answer I want to give you is, is the following. Uh, I think that the liberal conception of the market is, is really not a as soon as you look for it, you, you just discover that it's not true. Yeah, of course, it's <laughs> never. Yeah, <laughs> this, this is one more case of, uh, like that. So the, the, the pure, the pure, the pure and perfect markets of the textbooks really never exist. Yeah, and, and so and this is again one one new example of this. For example, I simplified a lot because one of the problems is that uh, in fact farmers were selling their, their goods to. Uh, Groups of, in fact, they sell their, their, their products to a group of, uh, of producers. And the, and the, the, the real uh, uh, exchange comes from the group of the, the farmers with the buyers. Okay? But still, it was very important because <clears throat> of many reasons. First of all, they also needed information. They were weaker than the, than the buyers, first of all. And second, the buyers were also producing their own data. You see? And so the government was, well, was supposed hopes to produce the only and real objective data. So this is very interesting because the buyers had the means to produce alternative data and they, they, it was the beginning of the construction of, uh, of uh, construction? No, yeah. the construction of uh, ignorance. You know? yeah. uh, so it was, the, it was the, first, the first example of construction of, of ignorance. They were, they were trying to produce data that were that were clearly in favor of the buy of the buyers, so diminishing the potential of profit. Agnotology, yes. Someone said it exactly. Yeah, he didn't say it. Uh, you said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Her name is Tsipi. 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 Yeah. Uh, she loved your talk, uh, right? It's, do you want to ask something? I mean, I mean, she's four numbers. Yeah. Um, Tsipi. Uh, I wanted to ask something, but it looks uh, a little banalic to me, so uh, I don't know if uh, it's going to be very interesting because lots of people will talk about it. But some uh, part of my research, I also 
have a, a communication uh, system uh, that I explore. Um, I, I research the collective forgetting of vaginal, vaginal bridge deliveries in obstetrics. Wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> how the doctors are collectively, have co collectively forgotten how to um, deliver these babies. That's me. Okay. Um, so they did for you. Sorry? They did for you. Yes, they did. Um, <laughs> most of them. And one of the things that I, um, that I looked for and I found that one of the things that helped this uh, situation, this uh, progress, uh, is a scoring system that quantified the, um, um, the, the um, all the decisions that the doctor had to, to make. Because he had to have lots of factors and each, each case was very complicated. It had to go and see the weight of the, of the, um, of the baby and the, the structure of the uterus and lots of things that uh, needed him uh, for him to, to make the call. How will I do it? And then in the 1960s and 70s, they began to make protocols uh, in the scoring system that literally scored all of the factors. One of the things I see that since they generated these protocols, the, um, it became more abstract. All the categories became more abstract. Instead of I have this situation of this baby and this um, and this uh, uh, woman and uh, and she has this history and I need to make the call for each and every case. We started to talk in general speaking, like this is low risk one to three, <laughs> and this is high risk five to seven. And as soon as you get the, the abstraction of that you can uh, raise the cut point. And now the, uh, the, the discussion is no longer um, which case I'm going to make the call. Uh, uh, the, it became uh, more abstract. Uh, will I make the call at three or at four? And it became much easier to not do the, the liberal, the, the, the vaginal delivery, which was very complicated. Um, and my, my question is, do you see some kind of abstractions that takes it to another level that um, stimulates progress, that stimulates all kinds of progresses, uh, which the quantification itself becoming uh, a, a stimulation factor. Okay, so first of all, to answer the beginning of your question, I answer for interesting. <laughs> I don't know what you do, but <laughs> it was interesting. And I, I wonder, really wonder why you asked this question. You, you didn't read the, the feminist textbook to the end. The girls should not ask whether the questions are interesting. They are interesting by definition. <laughs> so, first of all. Uh, second point, I think your point is super interesting, really, for the following reason. In fact, what uh, we forget very is that there are several kinds of reasons. I don't think it's a problem of abstraction because everybody is very abstract in medical, in medical practice, as you say. But the problem is the, is the problem of the articulation of how to put it. I'm sorry because I, this is something I'm, I'm taking in front of it. There, there is a kind of uh, medical doctors, they think with cases. They have, they have, they, they, they have cases in mind. And this is a Kind of thinking that we, we, we call in French prudence, prudential. You, 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 have to, you have to understand the whole, scale, the whole case, this, which is very abstract, and to, to understand what is the, 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 the specific information important for you so that you can act the more wisely. The more, the more, the more, yeah, you actually have to, to, to locate yourself <laughs> exactly, in, exactly. A, in, in a line. Whereas what you just described, it's algorithmic thinking. The scoring, you see, it's algorithmic thinking. And algorithmic thinking 
is very different from, let me say wise, I, I, I'm sure in English it's not true, the good word, but I, I'll try to do that. So you have two kinds of, 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 of thinking, which is algorithmic thinking and wide, wise thinking. And what happens sometimes with this quantification is that people got le get lost and they forget this, this wise thinking and they simply try to fit into the algorithmic thinking. But it makes you stupid. It doesn't make you abstract, it makes you stupid. You see what I mean? So the problem is to, to articulate those two kinds of thinking. And all the problem with digital health nowadays for med medical doctors is to find how to exert their wise thinking when you are so much uh, algorithmic, algorithmic tools that they can use. I hope I answered the question. Yeah. Yeah. It's also related to motivation from uh, senior doctor and senior responses on the you know, knowledge about cases and uh, other doctors are not you know, as knowledgeable as the senior doctor. And then to relation to um, uh, um, Evidence, 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 which is predictions and a, a calculation of probabilities, and, and the numbers are become, uh, you know, in front rather than the senior uh, of the knowledge of the senior uh, doctor to say so. And also the transition between the art of right. obstetrics uh, of uh, obstetrics and mm -hmm. to the medicine of obstetrics. Right. So, so it's it a good word because it, it, it describes or it captures exactly what I meant. It's like waste thinking. So, so it's, it's true. I mean, and it's interesting because this, many doctors who are much into, uh, into those algorithms and this digital health, very often they, they regret it. In the sense they, they need, I mean, algorithmic thinking is useful only if you don't forget the art of medicine. If you, if you replace one by the other, then it becomes to you know, you're, you're becoming back to your father. Tell them to your lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> to your lawyer, yeah. yeah. Tell, tell that first to your medical doctors and then you change. No, no, the doctor will say, okay, don't tell them to your lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one last <laughs> question. Um, in Bar, OECD. Are the OECD publishes on this? Yeah, okay. In bar, <laughs> uh, in bar, one of the students here is doing a work on the. On Do it, the, please, please. Yeah, on educational. Yes, yeah. yes, okay. Uh, on educational indicators. Go ahead. Um, I want to ask. Uh, Pisa, yeah, okay, so no worries. So it's, a very, it's another stage. No, yeah, you want me to say something about yeah. it? Well, the main, the main difference between PISA and what I said is that uh, PISA is not national. It's very different because being not national, you don't have a society to rely on. So you have to pre produce, produce data that are comparable. And this is a very different endeavor, you see, first of all. <clears throat> Second, well, we have in France a very complicated story towards PISA. Very interesting because when PISA did it, yeah, actually, uh, so what is PISA? I'm sorry, first of all, PISA is, uh, it's created by the uh, Eurostat, isn't it? It's, PISA is uh, produced by Eurostat itself. Eurostat produces PISA, no? OECD. The OECD, okay. But initially, so it's the OECD production and it's a way to measure the literacy of every country. And it's a comparison of, uh, the, of the different literacy of different countries. And <clears throat> since the beginning of PISA, the French were fairly bad. But the funny part is that initially everybody said, well, we really don't care about OECD data. <laughs> so nobody was looking at it. And all of a sudden, I don't know why, everybody became interested in it. And so now they're trying to adjust the, the whole uh, teaching system in France toward PISA. So PISA. <laughs> <Yeah, really. laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so, and so, so this is the point. But no, but the main point with PISA is that it's created to compare countries. And this is very, very different because in this case, you have, uh, you have 
I don't know, you know, Pisa, but I think you have only one question, or we have one question on that one country. No, but how many questionnaires do you have by countries? No, I mean, different countries have the same questionnaires? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Okay, so the point in this there case. Is, there is a, maybe two questions. Okay. Fine. But so in this case, the problem is that you have to adapt the questionnaire to the specific situation of the countries. And it loses or gains signification according to the fitting of the society, of this country, this society, to this question. So this is raised. This raised the problem of comparison. This is the, 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 the. Okay. One more. Here we talk about uh, the question of uh, Uh, I, I, I understand the question. So, and, and you're right. PISA is articulated to a completely different way to govern. PISA is a neoliberal tool. Why is it a neoliberal tool? We will finish up with neoliberal. Sorry, Maybe it's a benchmark. <laughs> it's benchmark. It is a right? benchmark, exactly. The point with uh, PISA is that so it compares countries so that every country gets frightened and want to act by himself. So in a sense, it is empowering, empowering the units, the countries, so that they put to work different policies to enhance their, 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 their results according to this comparison tool, this commensuration tool. Okay? So in a sense, in, the, in a sense, it's a way comparing countries is very interesting because it's a way to govern on the countries when you don't have any authority in these countries. So you see, OECD has no authority on any of these countries, but producing this data, then every country is comparing itself to the other countries, and they want to do better. And so they enhance their own school system so that PISA gets better. So it's a way that OECD governs France, in a sense. Who this means? France obeyed to Italy because we That's, that was my son. Italy. Sorry, initially they didn't really? uh, obey at all, but now okay. we are very frightened. Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. It has no authority, but there are power. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's through that. Direct the government yeah. policy through this. Exactly. So indicate the yeah. yeah. indicate So I have a friend, Isabel Grillo, the, the, the woman with whom I wrote the book, wrote the book Benchmarking. She, she wrote a book about this, about. Uh, about uh, in French, in French, it's in French. Well, it's easy. French is very good. <laughs> 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 you can eat if you are when you go to France. Okay. If you come to France, please come to see me. Uh, I'll be very happy okay. to see you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Thanks a lot for the invitation. It was a great presentation. I'm absolutely exhausted, but I, I'm happy. <laughs> so we will have a WhatsApp. And please don't, don't uh, travel with uh, Emmanuel or sit next to him. Please don't uh, ask him any questions. Now let me make that. Let me get you made. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Ma non è una cosa normale. 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 Non è una cosa norm